Hello, hello, and happy Friday. Happy Good Friday to everybody. It is Good Friday. Good to see you, Stephen. Good to see you, Dr. Conway. Hello, Mrs. Elliott. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Glad you could join us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So let's start off with um, Mrs. Elliott, will you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and how you came about um, to find the Moore Center? Sure. So my name is Karen Elliott. Uh, I was a resident of Virginia and now a happy resident of Jacksonville, Florida, thanks to uh, the Morris Center in Ponte Vedra Beach. Um, I am by trade an early childhood educator. Um, I've studied different points of early childhood education, um, early childhood special education, as well as English as a second language. And I've worked in several settings. Um, advocating and working with children um, with all different um, diversity, culturally, linguistically, and ability diverse children, um, including my own, who have taught me the most humility ever. And you realize that there's no tool bag big enough, um, you know, to help kids because there's always going to be something you don't know. Um, I am now the head of operations of Fortis Mortgage. Um, I process mortgages every single day and help a lot of um, people gain generational wealth um, so that I can be who I needed to be for my children. Awesome. So you have two children. Three. Uh, oh, three, three. children. Yeah. Uh, did all three of them attend the Moore Center or was it just the two of them? Actually, all three. They've all had a piece. Uh, in the Morris Center, and some actually with now as well, the neurodevelopment of words. So can you talk a little bit about that journey? What is it? What did that look like? Uh, um, let's let's kind of back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Everybody starts this journey at the same place, right? Which is my child struggling in school. Um, I don't know what's really going on. You reach out to the school for help. So let's, I mean, because that's basically where all of our journey starts when we start advocating for our kids in the yep. schools. So let's pick up from about, about that place to move forward. So I would say, I'll kind of start with Lee. Um, each of my children present very differently and each have had their unique challenges. And so from a developmental standpoint, I would say my journey is unique in that I noticed things early on, um, but with my background, we kind of worked on things at home um, just from preschool on. Um, so I will say it's unique in that way because I did understand some of the early indications of maybe there's a speech and language issue, maybe there's a processing issue um, there. Um, but what was interesting to me is that even with the background that I do have and have having taught kindergarten or preschool or things for many years, I was still like, something's not right here and I don't know what to do. So I began researching and trying to find something that was um, evidence-based. So my daughter, Lee, her journey kind of started, I would say in preschool. Um, she learned her letters. Okay. She held the sounds pretty well. It wasn't, she wasn't really showing reversals or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I do remember her having some speech kind of things like her name, even pronouncing her name, it was we for the longest time, we, right? Those are like simple little things that maybe it's cute, right? Um, so, I so let, me, let me stop you there because that, that's an important part right there that families and, and parents, we tend to look over when it's cute, mm -hmm. right? Like we used to laugh all the time because Asher would say, um, he'd be able to say everybody's name. We'd go, okay, can you say Asher? And he'd go, Hat. And we didn't understand that he was calling, he was saying his name was Hat. So, and we think that those things are cute, but we don't realize that those are the first red flags that we have that we really need to be identifying, you know, keeping track of, sorry. Exactly. Sorry. And see back then, dyslexia was not what I was thinking, right? I'm thinking, oh, maybe she's got some kind of frontal thing going on. Let me check for ties. Let me check for all these things, right? 
Um, she ended up getting her sound and we kept going, right? The one thing that stuck out for Lee though, um, with like, I would read her story. It was really hard for her to sequence or um, rhyming. I can remember playing umpteen rhyming games with her. It was harder for her. She did get it, but it was harder. Um, and then math. I can remember having those little, they're like red and yellow circle coins. They have them in most public schools. They're like foam. But in preschool, we were working on patterns. Patterns for math was like so hard for her. Just any kind of number sense things, right? And I say this because a lot of folks don't think about how dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia can show up in other places, right? And so these were some red flags that I worked with her on, but to me, it could have just been a developmental delay, or maybe it was just took her longer because, you know, Leo the late bloomer, right? You're thinking of all these things. Dyslexia, again, was not what I was thinking, right? She went through school. Um, she had a hard time first and second grade with um, reading. They were working on reading. She went to a private school in kindergarten. They used a Becca curriculum, which is very heavy phonics based, right? But I kept saying, something's not right. Like she's not a fluid reader. She's very slow. My best friend was a reading specialist. I had her read with her. We were doing all these things. I was so, like, something's just not clicking. So you, you being an educator, I'm going to dispel a myth here. So being an educator, I assume that you read to your daughter. Every single every day. day. And we did not have an issue with access to books. They call me the yep. book hoarder, actually. So my wife <laughs> used to read to our boys every night for an hour, every night, religiously, never, never uh, failed. So we can dispel the myth of if you read to your child more, they'd be able to read and they wouldn't be dyslexic. Not so. Not and so. you, I think for me too, like I had a lot of friends, it was funny um, because their kids would be reading three and four years old because they read to them every night. Right. And they'd be like, well, what's going on? Like you're a teacher. How come your kid isn't reading yet? And I'm like, well, they clearly have something else going on. We're trying to figure that out. But that's not for lack of trying, but I haven't found the thing, right? So, um, and they had access to books, material, mm -hmm. and they had an active parent in their life that read to them religiously. Mm -hmm. So we can knock, knock those two things off. So, but also, like, so one thing I'm a trained teacher, right? And I will tell you, I, Virginia State licensed early childhood education, early childhood special education, English as a second language, right? And I was specifically trained to work with children who are culturally, linguistically, and ability diverse. And every single, I would say, portion of my program dealt with literacy specifically and the types of books and how the brain develops and how children develop and acquire language and all of those things, right? And also, you are taught in some teacher preparation programs how to like the what a well-balanced literacy program is and different things like that right some programs are better than others but i will say that when you are a special education teacher the things that you learn about as far as um, the different types of neurodiversity that there is what you learn about is what you're interested in so if there's a student in your class that's curious about prader willi syndrome or cerebral palsy or um, a language delay or something like that, those are your research projects that you do. And then you begin to understand, right? Because there's so many things there, but they're not going to teach you about every single thing. And I hate to say it, but dyslexia is often not one that is even addressed. Um, but also when you have children in your class, that's another time when you go out and you're like, I've got to help this kid. Let me figure out how to help them, right? Um, so like for me, like I was trained in steps to literacy. I was trained in Lucy Calkins. I was trained in a lot of these different things. And then with Orton Gillingham, a lot of times what happens is, you know, it's a very tiered program where you have to, you know, you get your certifications, you, you have a certain number of hours that you have to do to be able to say I'm certified or, you know, I'm a master, I'm a senior or whatever the different levels are. Right. With that, even, um, depends on what school you're at if they have that, right? So I say all this to say that there's a lot of strategies and tools in my belt um, 
and I did try them with my children as well as had specialists working with my children because I did have access to a lot of different people. Like I said, my best friend is a, is a reading specialist. Um, and we often would talk about it. Right. Um, so, so can you talk about your feelings as a very educated person, especially when it comes to language and your own children and the people that you had working with your children, um, trying to get them to, to close that gap, trying to get to a grade level. Can you talk about the frustration? I mean, I, I assume that you felt a lot of frustration being as, as well trained as you are and the rest of the, the qualified people working with your kids, trying to get them to that grade level. So I wouldn't even say frustrated. It was more of broken hearted for me. Because what I find is that when you have a child that has a higher IQ, who I'll give an example of my son. That boy has been talking since before he was one in full sentences. Like, I do not remember a time when he was not talking, okay? He can comprehend like nobody's business, like nobody's business. You read him a story and he's gonna tell you, but he's also gonna be real squirrely when he tells you. You're probably not gonna follow the storyline. It's gonna be all over the place. It's gonna have all the details. But that's super impressive to an educator, especially in kindergarten and first grade, right? Um, so when that child is not reading, they're often getting, well, he should be able to do this. And that sometimes is said to your child and breaks them, mm -hmm. right? But also learning letters, he ran from it. He ran from learning any letter, any sound. He would see it and be like, nope, not interested, right? Um, the thing about my son too is he was a child that was very busy internally here um, as well as his body. Um, and so he would be easily distracted, right? A story though, he's gonna, he's gonna take it because he loved it, right? What does that also look like? Oh, we can't get him to stop talking and he's, he's moving too much or whatever. So it becomes all of these things, but he's so smart. He's just, he just doesn't want to do it. He's lazy. Right. When I know yep. very well. I I twitch a little bit. Hear, hearing teachers say, oh, he's just, they're just lazy makes my eye twitch. <laughs> did you hear no. that steven what's that you oh yeah did i hear that i heard that yeah. a lot growing up so yeah. i will say that we have been blessed in that um although these things did occur um we had some extremely loving loving professionals and loving teachers mm -hmm. for my children that i still stay in contact with who wanted to help just as much as we did mm -hmm. but Part of the issue is that the bandwidth just wasn't there. The bandwidth and it, it just wasn't there. And so we're trying all these things and, and Lord help you. It gets to a point where you're like, what in the world? I'm doing all this stuff and it's just not working, right? right. Um, and so you, you kind of have another baby in the midst of all this. Lee's at the heart of where her difficulty is, which was third and fourth grade, right? Langston is now in the first grade. He's at the heart of where his is popping up and I've got a new baby that just came along and I'm going, what the heck is happening? Because I'm getting these notes about he should be reading by now. Mm -hmm. He's so smart. We're now working on reading and he can't do the color blue and he's not holding sight words and he still doesn't have all of his letters and sounds. And I'm like, what's up? Because that hasn't been our focus at home because he wasn't interested. I'm going to keep him myself and let me see because it's been a minute, he's been in school, you know, let me let me see and work with them and see really what this thing is. So I ended up taking him midway through first grade. And I'm like, oh, he's doing a lot of wonky stuff. Like he's reversing everything. He's um, kind of looking at the page weird. And I'm like, this kind of looks like maybe this might be some dyslexia going on here, but I don't know enough. Cause I also know there's a thing called Erlen syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I know there's a lot of debate between these two and whether it's real and, and all these things. Let, let me do process of elimination. So I took him for the Erlen screening, which I had done for my daughter as well. And she's like, well, I don't know, but it could help him. Wasn't the same as my daughter who her shoulders went down. She started looking at the page. The filters kind of helped her. 
you know, she was able to read more fluently where he was like, I don't really want these. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? So I was like, well, I don't want to pay $3,000 for this assessment like I did with Lee. I've got to figure out and game this system. Let me put him back in school, but I'm going to put him in public school and get these testings. Well, it took me till, I don't know, March or April, even with my background, to get the agreement to test and eligibility and all those things. So it was by the end of the year, he was supposed to have this IEP still with no dyslexia, um, diagnosis because schools don't diagnose for that. And I was still on the waiting list for the neuropsychologist. So COVID happened. We ended up at home. That was my son's journey in the beginning. And Lee, my daughter, she um, ended up at home too. But it was more of like, she was doing okay and her teachers love her because she was very compliant at school. She kind of sat, she did the best she could. Um, she did okay grade wise, but I knew she wasn't retaining anything or mastering anything. Um, and when, when she came home, there were so many gaps, like so many gaps, like basic addition in math was missing. She wasn't holding it. Um, same thing with like retelling a story. So I'm sitting here working on all these things and I'm going, I have to find a program that works. So I went online, it took me probably six months of being home to find it, which ended up being nor development of words. Um, what I did, my core criteria was, I want to see the research. I want to know that it actually works. I don't want to waste money. Right. And so I started looking at all these programs and I'm like, but okay, this is cool. Uh, looks like it worked for these kids. Okay. This makes sense. This is better. Honest literacy. Oh yeah, this works. This is how I, I, I learned. Right. But I'm like, but where are the where are the trials? Where are the controls? Like, how do I know that this actually works? Like, not this word of mouth stuff. Where's the actual studies? And I guess that's where my sociology background came in. Because, you know, a lot of my classes was sociology of education or prison the pipeline or, you know, just whatever. And I'm like, I need to see some scientific backing of these programs. The only one I found that had the studies that showed me the the graphs and the, you know, well, you know, if you study this for long enough, you get this result. And if you have this age group, I'm expecting to see this over here. That was neurodevelopment of words. And I'll be honest, I was super skeptical because let me tell you, first of all, it seemed like Oz to me because when I would look everywhere, it was like, well, it's this program and um, it's got everything included and everybody loves it. And I could not find negative reviews. And I'm like, there's no way on the planet that somebody has not like slammed this program somewhere, right? And I'm like, what in the heck? Like, I cannot find anything. And I'm like, okay. I'd seen like what Davis, the Davis method. I looked at that. Mm -hmm. I looked at um, Barton and Wilson. I had looked at, I, I, it's like umpteen programs, like no lie. Like I looked at all these things and I'm going through and I could find it for them, but I could not find it for this. And I'm like, this is insanity. So I called and I said, um, you know, can you guys give me some information? Right. And so I'm getting this information, but I still don't really know what I'm signing up for. Like, what am I really signing up for? And I talked to my husband about, it. I'm like, babe, we're going to try this program. It's really expensive, but we're going to try it. Right. I said, but let me tell you something. When I added up the cost for these other tutoring programs, this actually is actually less because it seems like when they're done, they're done. But also, it seems like you're just paying it up front versus a long time over time, right? So I'm like, it makes sense. It makes sense monetarily, babe. And he's like, all right, well, this is your thing. I'm going to step out of it. You got this. So um, I enrolled my son first um, in now. And uh, he began online, I think it was like April of his fourth grade year, maybe. Um, he did foundations online. He finished... I want to say January he was done, January of the next year. So what is that? Eight, nine months. I don't know. I never added it up. It's not very long from April to January and he was done. I let him stay an extra month or two to kind of generalize because I wanted to make sure that he was not only just doing what the program said, but could it put on schoolwork. What I noticed in that time is at first I kind of like, I video recorded him reading 
And it was really, you know, slow and like sounding out every word and like taking forever. Right. And then um, I kind of just left them alone because they don't like have homework or anything. It's five days a week. He did it 45 minutes a day. Um, we had some breaks in there, like if we were doing something, but not very many. Um, by the end, he was reading, like, like reading, like reading, reading, right? It was still a little slow. And I was like, well, you know, it doesn't seem like he has full fluency. I called and talked to the wonderful ladies. Um, and they said, well, you know, he still needs occupational therapy and he's not done with the program. You know, he really needs this next part. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I took a break and was like, you can take a quick break. Let me figure out how we're going to do this. And I was, you know, it was like February and I talked to my husband and I said, you know, I really would love to take them in person because it works. I know we're not wasting our money and Lee really needs this, my daughter. And so, um, we did this, devised this whole plan and ended up at the Morris Center in Punta Vida Beach last summer. And uh, they went every day of the summer. They gave up their summers. And um, it's probably the most life-changing, best decision I've ever made in my entire life. Um, everybody here is so unbelievably loving and intelligent. Um, my kids actually asked to come here just to say hi um, after a full day of school, which is like, who does that? Um, but what they gained here is confidence. They gained balance. Um, they gained a lot of things. Like it's, it's so many things I really can't sit here and name them, but like their occupational therapy sessions. First of all, let's just talk about the gym. I've never in my life seen anything like it. I've seen a lot of them in my life, just in the schools or the different rooms or whatever. This is insanity. Just say it's like, the Disneyland of occupational therapy. Okay. That that's my best scenario for it. It's like this big gymnasium. The kids love it. it's favorite part of their day. Um, because it was so beautiful and Luna had shown some early signs, which was my baby that I mentioned. Um, she was slow to talk. She really didn't talk till she was two or three fully. Um, she said some words and then she regressed and it was kind of strange. Um, and but she was a lover of all things reading. She could pick, keep her numbers and letters and all that stuff straight that the other kids had a hard time with. But like, um, she had a lot of just interesting things. And I was like, eh, let's go ahead and look for early intervention for her because we know a lot of times the dyslexia is genetic. Um, so I had her evaluated for occupational therapy, which she met um, the needs for that. She did. She joined the program and did occupational therapy. She's in, did the summer camp. She did a lot of the foundational skills. Um, my baby left here. She's jumping rope. She's trying to ride her bike. By the time she finished, she was swimming, not because she was doing lessons, but because she got in the pool and decided to put to use those bilateral coordination skills that she worked on in OT. And she swam across the pool. Um, Pretty amazing stuff, balancing on her scooter. Um, and she's in kindergarten. It's funny, I went for a parent-teacher conference, what, hmm, a month or two ago, and they were like, well, she's, you know, like in the kindergarten skills. She's she's A-OK. -okay. Like every time I go, she's A-OK. -okay. No, no worries here. Um, so a lot of the things that I feel like I noticed with the other kids, I'm not noticing with her. So let me, like, let me um, go back a little bit. You mentioned that, yeah, there was a there was a point in time that y'all decided, hey, we're gonna go into the clinic, and then all of a sudden you see the what we call success. We you start to see the real progression. Um, can you talk about from a from two different points? I'd like to hear your 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 thoughts on from a parent's perspective. Mm -hmm. what that felt like seeing your child struggling, struggling, struggling and everything that you're trying. And now they're not. And then talk about it from take your, your parent hat off and put your education educator hat on. And then what that looks like when you have a student who you've done everything that you could possibly do for, and they can't read, they, they just, it won't click as people like to say, and then all of a sudden you see them 
breeding and progressing and thriving over here? So I know I've said a lot and I probably, you know, talked your head off for a second, but it's really hard for me because I feel like my head is full because I have the two hats. <laughs> it's hard to separate them. So um, I use I use my son a lot because it's it's more of a straight path. Right. It's easier for me to describe. Right. Because he he did foundations online. Then he came to um, the Morris Center started uh, mental imagery. As he started progressing in mental imagery, he added in grammar and writing, right? And so he also was getting occupational therapy. So for him, you know, the entire summer we were doing, you know, 15, 20 minutes every night because he had finished foundation. And that's a part of what he needed to do. No different than what we had done from the time he was born. Um, watching his fluency pick up and saying, mom, can we go to Target and pick up a book was music to my ears, right? Music to my ears. Um, and let me jump in real quick, Karen, because the point you just made is really important to clarify from a research perspective. Many people will misquote the research and say, well, if they're 10 and they haven't got reading skills, it's going to take years to close the fluency. And no study has shown that you really change fluency. The actual research says for kids who are 8 to 10 years of age, we took them from the 5th percentile to the 45th percentile, and we showed dramatic change in the reading accuracy. That was just sounding out words. It wouldn't be developmentally appropriate to think if you just learned how to sound out words and you're 10, you're going to be as fast and as fluent as reading as someone who's been reading for three or four, maybe even five years. So our perspective on that was let's wait and bring them back one and two years later. So in the research study that we did with the Torgerson group and the Morris Center, and I was the guy who trained all the teachers in the early version of Now Foundations, we understood we had changed accuracy, and we knew it would take one to two years of practice before you could see the fluency gap close. Um, that's what the data showed later on. So yes, they changed accuracy first, but within one to two years after accuracy, which is just practice, then the fluency closed. And if you think developmentally to kids who don't have reading problems, where do they get fluency from? They just practice. Mm -hmm. And the more they practice, the more word knowledge they build up, the more sight words they build up, the more easy the coding builds, the more the comprehension starts building if all of those systems are working and the fluency then comes along. So it's really important for folks to understand that you can still close the gap in fluency, but it needs to be a developmental approach that builds those neurological phonological skills, not just doing auditory training and phonological skills, because there aren't studies that show that's going to change it. So it's really important for folks to understand you can close a gap in fluency, mm -hmm. but it actually is a bigger gap at 8, 10, 12, because there are other studies with five-year-olds. The five-year-olds made equal gains in fluency and accuracy because they're being compared to other five-year-olds and they haven't read very much. So they're not that far ahead developmentally in their reading practice. So the younger they are, you'll see a faster gain in fluency and accuracy. The older they are, you change the accuracy first, and then the developmental cycle kicks in. Now, the more they practice, the more they read, the more they use the skills, then the fluency begins to build over time. And we did another five-year study just on fluency because NICHD was so interested in, okay, you guys changed accuracy in the 8 to 10-year-olds, but you didn't immediately change fluency. And we're like, yes, because that's how the brain development works. You don't come out with a new skill and be just as fast as somebody has been practicing for three or five years. But they really wanted to study. So we did another study and we measured both groups got the same um, amount of hours that now foundations program to build a neurological phonological process, which is multisensory of visual plus acoustic plus oral tactile kinesthetic plus the graphemes plus the cognition piece of it really building that natural phonological system as it typically develops for individuals who don't have dyslexia. And then one group got 40 hours of fluency training. Choral reading, repeated reading, you know, phrases, repeated jumping, you know, and flashcards of sight words, all the things that are supposed to be the best approach for changing fluency. The other group just got 40 more hours of doing the Now Foundations program to work on their efficiency and proficiency of becoming easier and more fluent at just sounding out words and becoming even more proficient at using their skills. And at the end of that five year study, the kids who just got more practice and becoming more proficient with their phonological processing, 
more efficient with their decoding skills, had better reading fluency than the kids who had 40 hours of fluency training. So you well, just kind of describe that from a personal experience. I just want to throw the science perspective in. Go ahead, Steve. I was just also going to say, I want to make sure that people understand um, just in real layman's terms, what we tend to think fluency is, you, you, you had mentioned Dr. Conway about flashcards and sight words. We see so many times that people think fluency is because I can name off all these words that I've memorized, that memorization and repeating those words is not fluency. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it's so funny to, to listen to Dr. Conway speak because <laughs> I keep saying he's brilliant. Like it, his brilliance is just so inspired, amazing to me. Um, but listening to him put into words our experience, and it's a study, is amazing to me because my kids were not lacking of the sight word practice. I can remember putting plates on the wall and them shooting um, Nerf guns at them and, you know, the kinesthetic tactile sand and the um, playing hopscotch to name the letters of the sounds. Like all of the things that we are taught are the um, balanced literacy or, you know, different approaches. And then, you know, can you, you know, what sound do you expect to see or, you know, what sound or letter do you expect to hear at the beginning of the word and different things like that. Like, you know, uh, what is it? Elconian boxes mm -hmm. where you have to, mm -hmm. your box, your sounds, or, I mean, there's just, there's so many things that my kids have access to because I am an educator. I have taught reading. I have taught preschool. I have taught kindergarten. I've taught second grade. I've taught fifth grade. Like they have access to these things, but guess what? They still had a hard time. Why? Because I was not using something that had research behind it that was proven to work for them because they are neurodivergent. They did not acquire language the same way as a typical child does. Um, and so I will just say that we have been tremendously blessed to be able to do um, participate in this program. I will say that from a mother's standpoint, it's, it's like getting the best gift ever watching your child go from turning away anything that dealt with reading or standing in front of somebody or any of that, writing a paper or writing a note or feeling like you don't get to put a note in their lunchbox without pictures because they can't read it. Like I didn't put lunchbox notes. I wanted to, but the most I could do is write a heart and the letter U or something like that because I knew he couldn't read it or whatever. Now, guess who's making notes? And guess who went and tried out for a play at his school, a cold read on a script at that, at the beginning of this school year, not now, at the beginning of this school year. Cold read for a script um read it and guess who got chosen to be the lead of the play saying in front of people like what it, last year wasn't reading yeah getting of the school year i can remember his teachers asking me about like what can we do to support him he goes to a school that's project based wonderful school um, and we know that children learn best through what their interests and preferences, the school really caters to that. Um, his writing, just to get the morning journal done at the beginning of the year. Now, granted, he had done mental imagery and finished, but he was just starting grammar and writing with the NOW program. Um, even though he had, he started a little bit at the Morris Center, but really hadn't gotten that far because the summer was spent on mental imagery. He was having a hard time handwriting his schedule in the morning. They were like, he really has to be here at eight. He needs to come in right away because he's having a hard time finishing. He might well write a sentence on his page. I just went in three weeks ago and they said, it's really miraculous. What is, I know that he's been working at home, but like, what are you guys doing 
because we like offer him the computer because I know he preferred speech to text. Now he declines it and he's writing full on paragraphs. What are you doing? Because we need to know what this is. He's now taking his journal and talking about, mommy, can we go to the Morris Center? Because I need to show my OTs what I'm writing. <laughs> like, it's amazing. That's when you've unlocked that potential. Yep. And now he's got the skills that I try to explain to people. There's a difference between making progress and literally closing the gap between their IQ being here and their skills being down here. When the skills now are on par with the IQ, then the child can just flourish and grow and doesn't need accommodations doesn't need supports or strategies or heaven forbid assistive technology because this isn't blindness. It's not something that can't be changed. It's something that with the right evidence-based services, things can be dramatically changed. And I think two things, again, from the science perspective that Karen um, touched on was she did all the right activities. There are all kinds of good activities that follow the list of ingredients that now people are calling the science of reading. Some phonology, some semantics, some morphology, some you know phonics. You had all the right ingredients, but without the recipe, you're just making it up and you're randomly trying the ingredients and there's no chance that we'll get a guaranteed consistent outcome if everyone's just randomly using the same list of ingredients. So we brought in the same ingredients, but we had a recipe that had been tested and proven to be highly effective. The other key thing you brought up that many people struggle to understand is multi-sensory has two ways it can be applied. There can be multi-sensory memorization and there can be neurodevelopmental multi-sensory learning experiences. So when you're doing sandpaper stuff with letters or drawing letters in um, rice or you know, having them you know, shoot at the letters on the paper, those are multi-sensory activities to memorize the phonics. Mm -hmm. But what I say to many teachers and many large groups of faculty or even pediatricians, I'll say, does multi-sensory instruction always lead to better results? And most educators and others will say, oh, yeah, multi-sensory is always better. Their, their hand shoots up and say, yeah, yeah, multi-sensory. I said, so that would mean that if I ask children to shake their leg while they're reading, they're going to become better readers than the kids who don't shake their leg. I'm like. No, that's not going to help. I said, exactly. But that would be multisensory because leg shaking is another tactile sensory input. So it's not that multisensory leads to better learning. It's neurodevelopmentally based multisensory instruction, which means if we study the brain and children who don't have learning difficulties, it's like, what's the brain typically doing to build phonological awareness? And there's now this pendulum swing going back and forth where People were putting up pictures of the mouth on the walls and they're creating, you know, sound walls because they're realizing, hey, the mouth actually has something to do mm -hmm. with phonology and the mouth actually has something to do with helping with phonics. But if you use it for memorization, it's not going to work as well. Other people are now saying the mouth has nothing to do with this stuff. You shouldn't be putting mouth pictures up. I guarantee you those people have never studied typical language development because typical language development is Infants start watching your mouth move mm -hmm. by eight months of age. So the mouth has everything to do with phonological awareness. But they're not just using their visual watching their mouth. They're using their acoustic to hear what you're saying. They're mapping visual plus acoustic. And then around eight to 12 months of age, they're doing a lot of babbling. So now using oral tactile, which is touch, how the teeth, tongue, and lips form different positions to produce sounds. And then they're using oral kinesthetic, which is can you feel your mouth getting to the right shape? Can you feel your tongue sticking out between your teeth to make that TH sound versus your teeth come down and bite your bottom lip to go and make that F sound? So absolutely the mouth is an important piece of this and absolutely multi-sensory is important, but it has to be based and grounded on neurodevelopmental science. Then you're going to get the best outcomes. And that's where the Now Foundations program came from because it was basically started from looking at what the Lindenwoods had done in 1969 with their first multi-sensory developmental speech language program called auditory discrimination in depth. So all the things that Karen's talking about was came from her good experience as a teacher. But if we don't help teachers have the ingredients and the recipe, we're not going to get the same amount of gains of what Langston has just done and what kids did in our research studies. So these are all just really important pieces of combining science with education and practice. I'm laughing because, you know, I was just talking about the mouth. I asked Langston, um, probably right after foundations. I don't even think we had come to the Morris Center yet. I said, Langston, 
you made all this growth. Like, what? what's so different? Like, you had all these wonderful teachers. You had mommy working with you. What did it? Like, how did this click and the others didn't? He said, well, mommy, I had to move my mouth. It was my mouth, mom. It's something they did. It helped me. That's literally what he just explained and likes to put it in layman terms for me. And I was like, well, okay. And it made sense because I had heard enough just listening to him do it online. And I'm like, okay, so that makes sense. Some of the little quirky things he said made sense to me. There's a lot of little cues and things like that. He just, he held on to it and it's, and it's pretty much done. Um, I focused on my son mainly because he started the program and has had more experience in it. But what I will say is that I have a child, a daughter who is now 15. Um, she did occupational therapy. She finished foundations here in the Morris Center. Um, and she began um, mental imagery. She is still, we are still pushing to get her to do, um, to finish online mental imagery, but she is a child who just does better in person. There are some children like that. She does have a lot going on, um, but I will say that that doesn't stop her journey. Um, she has made tremendous gains, um, so much so that she felt like she didn't need any more help. Mm -hmm. So we're fighting against her confidence in that I can do this. I know what I'm doing, mom. I don't need any more of that. So to me, it's a win. But it's also hard because I'm trying to tell her, like, no, like, you're not done. It's still hard for you in some places, and you still need to get to math because remember what I told you, her math is the most difficult thing for her, right? But she needs to build, and I understand that. She needs all the pieces because she needs to get to the foreign language piece, which is the math, right? Um, she has now agreed to try to try again, right? <laughs> But she's a teenager. She's going through adolescence and things like that. So it's a little bit different journey. Mm -hmm. But um, her growth is there nonetheless. Like OT was amazing for her. Um, she had a lot of coordination and balance issues. She's um, The cool thing here is that if you ever to call an occupational therapy, and I'd like to challenge everyone watching, call occupational therapist's office and ask them, do they know what a sensory integration certified occupational therapy, do they offer it? And usually what you'll hear is that they've taken a class or, oh, I work with children like that all the time. But when you really dig in and ask them about a certification, most times it's not there, which is why one of the main reasons we came down here, because I wanted someone that really knew how to integrate on the sensory side, um, because that means they're going to work in that pyramid for occupational therapy. Go check out. Dr. Conway, because he'll show you what pyramid I'm talking about. I am not that smart. I won't even try to explain it to you, but I know that it works and that's how you need to do it. Um, and so for her, you know, there was a lot of like emotion regulation zones that were gone through. Um, they worked a lot on her balance. They worked a lot on um, tactile kinesthetic sensory things with different feelings. Um, if you ever have a child that has a hard time eating different foods or maybe they have an issue with a pencil grip, or you notice they trip a lot, um, or maybe they're not able to ride a bike, mm -hmm. or maybe they have a hard time swimming and keeping their feet level or different things like that. Those are all signals that something in the occupational therapy realm could help your child. Um, so don't overlook it. Mm -hmm. Yes, all kids do develop at different paces, but those are things that I feel like um, we as parents, need to know because like, I'll give you an example. My son, he has abs like nobody's business, super strong, but guess what? He doesn't activate, he didn't activate his core. So although he was strong, he wasn't activating it to use it for different things, which in, the, in turn impacted the way he would sit, which in turn would impact how he would write. And he does have dysgraphia. So he needed to be able to activate it so that he could do what he needed to do with his shoulder because the strength in your shoulder matters, but you have to be able to sit up straight to use your shoulder properly so it goes down your arm and your hand works properly, right? Um, so there's all these things. Um, and then, you know, you have my little, you know, she's she's thriving, but I would say that it's still, you know, out of 100% of kids that get intervention, 80% of them don't, don't need services later. Um, so, but then what about the, the 20%, right? 
Um, so, you know, I'm hoping she's she's part of the 80, but guess what? I'm going to keep pushing along and guess who I'm going to try to push her back in summer school to make sure um, if there's any gaps that I'm missing or, or anything, she's getting it because I want her to thrive mm -hmm. like my oldest does, you know? So we're going to keep, you know, our, our journey's not over, but this time next year, guess who will be done? My son, because mm -hmm. yep. he's almost done with... Um, grammar and writing and he's got one more piece left which is the math and he's very excited because he should be done with that mm, maybe the end of may first part of june july he'll be done and then he'll jump into that so i, I can't even tell you <laughs> how how good it feels not to have to go to 504 or ip meetings anymore i mean that is or when you go in there uh it's real easy they're like yeah we're we're following everything we need to follow. Yeah, your child's making great uh, grades and progress and everything else, and everybody's on the same page, and you're in and out in five minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that to me is such a relief that we don't have to deal with any of that anymore. You asked me something that I kind of held off on answering. You said put on my teacher hat, right? That This right here is what my teacher hat looks like. I'm getting on lives. I'm walking down the street telling my neighbors I am messaging people in my messenger. I'm calling people. I'm in all kinds of dyslexia groups. For me, being a teacher is just as important as being an advocacy expert. So for me, advocating for those children that were in my classroom, maybe I never touched them. Maybe they're in somebody else's classroom. Maybe there's a parent out there who has a story like mine. I want everyone to know. Because guess what? If you don't have the knowledge and you don't know, how are you going to do better? And for me, it's like, I don't get paid to do any of this, okay? For me, it's, listen, I want your kid to be happy just like mine and have a chance. I don't want you, your child to be out there like, I can't to do this. Because guess what? That was my oldest. Mm -hmm. She all but stopped school. She went to school, but she would tell you, I go for my friends. I don't go to learn. But she was done. It was too hard. Yeah, when you, you get put into an environment that and told to do something that you're physically unable to do, why am I here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm taking up space. I'm either going to get in trouble or I'm going to get in trouble. Or in my case, I got in trouble. Well, she, she didn't get in trouble. Her issue was she just stopped. Just withdrawal. Yeah, that's, just, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I did too. I just stopped. Yeah. That's why I got in more trouble. I mean, so mm -hmm. it was either I was getting in trouble because of behavior younger, and then I'd get in trouble because I wouldn't turn in my work, trouble. And then I got in trouble at home because I didn't turn in my work, and I got in trouble at school. So trouble would just follow me around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and then finally, I was just like, you know what? I'm done with all this. Mm -hmm. And now she's starting to revert back to some of that. Um, but that's because I was fighting against the, oh, I can do this. I am smart. I know what I'm doing. I don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's, right. Like, it's like a double-edged sword. It gives you so much confidence sometimes that you're like, I'm not doing that. I don't need it. And now she's going, uh, I think you might be right because this part is still hard for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So now uh, I'm gonna go, we'll see, you have the tools at your at your right there. Take it. Absolutely. And she yep. she built them before. Yep. And so she knows she can do it. And that she recognizes now that maybe I want to strengthen this skill too. Exactly. That's that maturity starting to kick in. And and the part of adolescence to push it back is that we want them to get enough strength to leave the nest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you got to get them there with all the skills and all the tools. When they leave, they got the best chance of success. Yeah. And I felt, you know, I feel like every story is just as important as the next. And although I did focus more on my son, but that's because he's done more of the program. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to explain to you what a dynamic difference it does doing it. But I want to tell you that every kid's going to be different. And their journey is going to be different, you know, but take the risk. This isn't, this isn't Oz. Like I thought it was like, it's a real thing that really does help. Stephen, we lost your mic. Oh, sorry about that. So I was saying, can I challenge you on that, that statement just a tad? Cause I, no. I agree with you that every, every 
the journey is going to look different slightly. However, I can promise you from all the people that I've ever talked to that are dyslexic, no matter if you're a little kid or you're old like me, when you start telling the story, the underlining journey is exactly the same. Yeah, that is The true. symptoms are exactly the same. The characters change, right? I've mm -hmm. changed the characters' names to protect the innocent. I mean, that's that's really what I tend to see when interviewing uh, families and other dyslexics in our, our community. Um, the time may change, some of the circumstances may change, but the underlying story is exactly the same. You're right. And then let me add a different piece to it to say, even though the journey might be a little bit different, even Stanislas Dehane, who's just studied language development from a scientist perspective, We've studied from the scientist perspective and the actual rehab, empowerment, changing the skills perspective. Everyone's got to go through the same steps. Everyone has to have phonological awareness. Everyone has to have sight word skills. Everyone has to have you know, comprehension, meaning, and there's a development, a hierarchy to how those are built. So some people say, well, how can you take every kid through the same steps? I mean, said, because that's how the brain works. The speed with which they master step one or step two or step three in any of the now companies programs, whether it's now foundations or now mental imagery or now grammar and writing or now math concept imagery or even in OT, it's the same steps, but the rate with which they might master the steps varies from one to the other. But from a empowerment perspective, why are we doing this program from step one to step 100 every time? We never start anybody at step 50. You never start to at step 75. It's because we're going through a developmental hierarchy that's been highly studied, highly tested. And we want to trust that you've had some experience. We want to verify that those systems are working efficiently at your IQ level. So that kind of trust but verify approach means we're making sure that the foundations are rock solid strong. And so is the first story of the house, the second story of the house, and the third story of the house. And we just keep developmentally building up those stories. So typically there's that's, that's, yeah. I was just gonna say typically that's 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 hard for people to really grasp is getting your your weaknesses up to the same level as your strength. Yes. They, they tend to think that those weaknesses will really always be hardwired at that level and you'll never be able to get that. That's the reason why we tend to see and, and hear about the whole dyslexia as a superpower right. or all of my coping skills that i've i've gained are superpowers when really when we start talking about what those truly are they're survival skills mm -hmm. yeah. they're survival skills yeah. because we've been put into that environment and then asked to do something that we like i said physically can't do right then which is read sound out words spell words everything that we have to do in an in a educational environment so we we are learning to survive versus learning to learn. Yeah. And, and it's quite a paradox too, Steve, when you have people, typically it's adults who throughout their lifetime, they've had educational experiences and people have tried to teach them how to read, but usually the instructions always started like what we call building a house from the second story up. They've gone straight to phonics, but in every language in the world, you speak the language first. It's a spoken language system. It's a sound-based system with the multi-sensory, developmental sensory pieces of it first. The letters come later. Spelling comes after that. You know, reading before spelling. Then comes writing. There's a whole developmental hierarchy. So if you've only had instruction that went from the second story up, you've not really had proper instruction to build the skills. But most adults with dyslexia who've never had much progress feel like their brain is just hardwired differently and it can't change. Like, yeah, but if that's true, then how come you learned your profession? How come you learned to be a contractor? Because your brain had to learn some things to do that. So it's not a problem with your brain's ability to learn. If you've never been given the proper instruction, the brain can't build the skills. And no one will actually be confused by, if you never really got proper German instruction, why would we expect you to be fluent in German? But everyone kind of gets a sense of, okay, well, dyslexic brains work differently, which is like half of the fMRI research. Yes, there's a difference in activity more on the right than the left, and there's weaker phonological processing and weaker decoding skills. Some actually have better sight word skills, but the functionally reading is not efficient. But what people forget, tend to forget or don't know is, but if we go in and remediate those skills, which means take the weaker phonological skills and bring them to the IQ level, 
take the weaker decoding skills, bring them to the IQ level. And then we put you back in the fMRI machine. The brain activity has changed. And now that dyslexic person has brain activity on the left, looks identical to a person who does not have reading problems. And on standardized testing, their reading skills are not deficient any longer. They now are in the average or above average range, typically on par with their IQ. So you can't expect the brain one to have the same activity pattern when the brain with the dyslexic actually doesn't have skills that the brain with the typical reader does have. Of -hmm. course, they have different activity patterns. They have different skills. But two, you have to not also make the false assumption that your brain can't learn and build wiring over time because you've already demonstrated that's not true. You might become a bricklayer. You became a plumber. You became an electrician. You know, you're a surgeon and you've got all these amazing skills that you build. But if you've not had proper evidence-based, and by when I say evidence-based, we're talking about the Dr. Sally Shaywitz definition of evidence-based. Dr. Sally Shaywitz says the only real evidence-based level of instruction is if it's been tested by randomized controlled trials. That is the medical grade standard. Most people think that's what education is doing as well. But if you see DOE definitions of evidence-based, it says, oh, but you know, if there's a group of people who have seen a program work and they think it's actually effective, it's okay to call that evidence-based too. Well, now we've got an apples and oranges definition of the same terms. So it's really important that we push education to be on the same par, the same definition, the same caliber of science that's evidence-based with randomized controlled trials as what happens in medical discoveries and medical advancements. That's one thing that sets the NOW programs apart from any other dyslexia program is we have three five-year randomized controlled trials that were funded by NICHD, peer-reviewed by a panel of national experts. And then we got these massive gains of going from fifth percentile to 45th percentile. So it's really just trying to bring the science about over to education because if we didn't give pediatricians penicillin, they would not be very effective at actually treating strep throat. And we'd still have children, adults, teenagers dying of strep throat. If we don't give educators evidence-based programs tested and proven to be highly effective for the majority of students, then we can't really expect education to get much better in its literacy rates. And we have 51 years of evidence that literacy rates have not improved in the U.S. in 51 years. Well, Mrs. Elliott, I really appreciate you coming on here and and sharing your story. Um, I think it's really important for our families to hear uh, stories such as yours and, and ours and uh, others because it shows them that they're not alone, right? So it, it shows them that um, the journey that they're going through, the, the situations that they're dealing with um, are not unique to them and their family. And we are out here to support them and help them um, in any way possible. We've got a great quote from one of the users who are watching this, which is not really a quote, I should say. It's a great confirmation of, yeah, filling in the cracks is not good enough because then you're actually waiting for the dam to have another crack in it. And you're not really investigating why it's getting these cracks. Um, It's always better to shore up the foundation and prevent there from being any more, quote, cracks or gaps in skills. That's the difference between a tutoring-based approach is trying to fill in a missing skill set. Mm-hmm. A developmental approach is build the foundation that you know is going to make it less likely to ever have any gaps or ever have any weaker skills. And it's going to give us the strengths of skills all the way through that developmental hierarchy. And that's what we call pushing the child along. Yeah. It doesn't. Call it kick the can education. Yeah. yeah. You, can't, like. you can't do it. You can't do it. They need all of it. Yeah. It's... Um, the, the other thing that I know that some of the listeners will have heard this terminology is splintered skills. When we, when we don't teach in that developmental model, we end up getting those splintered skills or just like uh, Amy was saying here, it's, it's about having those cracks uh, in our foundational skills. So. Well, we'll end with one comment from our our resident adult dyslexic, who's also a sheriff's deputy, who sends me text messages pretty much monthly with a picture of a new novel. And then Deputy Agata shares there his comment that he's now read 70 novels. And that's just super powerful 
that an adult who was in his 50s before he actually figured out that he needed help with his dyslexia is now so excited that he reads novel after novel after novel and is happy to brag about it every single time. And I'm happy to get the text that he can do it. And that also helps show that there's not an age limit when this can happen. But what Mrs. Elliott's also showing is, yeah, but it's a lot better if we catch them when they're five. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less trauma. There's a lot less frustration. There's a lot less self-esteem issues. This is the way to do it is with early intervention. Yep. So we better end with that comment. And till next time, we hope people will join us next week. We'll do another show with more information. And Mrs. Elliott, thank you again for sharing your story about your kids. And Stephen, thanks for all the great moderation that you do as well. And thank you for all the listeners and the folks who will watch this when it's recorded and posted up on our YouTube channel for the Now Company. It's Now Programs Online. It's the YouTube channel. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.